There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to this installment of our Globe and Next Generation Science Standards webinar series. Thank you to everyone who is able to join us today. We are recording this session and will make the recording available in a day or two through the link in the Teaching and Learning section of the GLOBE website. Our objectives for today are to provide the U.S. GLOBE community members with an opportunity to learn about and discuss the conceptual shifts of the next generation science standards and have a conversation about how GLOBE fits in with NGSS. This is our schedule for the day. First, David will lead us through our uh, last conceptual shift discussion about how engineering and science practices are integrated in NGSS. Then Kristen will lead us through the brainstorming questions that we have been using throughout the webinar series. And that will help bring us back to thinking about um, what, does GLOW or what does NGSS mean to GLOW. And then finally, I'll present some thoughts about how to align standards that address what a student will be assessed upon with our protocols and activities um, that educators will use in the classroom to prepare them for that assessment. As a reminder, in this series of webinars, we've already covered six conceptual shifts, um, those that are listed in green on this slide. Uh, the recording of all of our past webinars is available on the GLOBE website in the Teaching and Learning section under Professional Development Resources. Today we are going to discuss shift number five, and that's my cue to turn the mic over to David so that we can begin. Well, hi everybody. My name is David Bedlowski, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And as, um, as Marcy was talking about, our topic is science and engineering. I'm a science consultant at uh, what is called an intermediate school district in Wayne County, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. We service the Detroit public schools and the surrounding schools in our county. And uh, it's, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be a GLOBE partner as we've been for the past 15 years. So. Um, as I mentioned, we're basically Detroit, Michigan, and it's nice to be with you today. The next generation science standards have posed a very interesting, uh, maybe problem to us in science education, and that is most of us who were trained in science education were really not trained in engineering education. And now uh, our science teachers have to start looking at the practices of not only science, but the practices of engineering. So that's really the focus for uh, today's presentation, is to look at the next generation science standards with a focus on engineering, and then see how GLOBE is able to bring science and engineering together. One of the uh, points that I mentioned, as we said, it kind of presents that dilemma is that many teachers have probably talked about engineering technology during their science courses, but it really hasn't been anything that they've emphasized, that it's kind of always been sort of an addition to the curriculum. Now it's a very important part of the curriculum, but people are, would say, well, why would we want engineering education in our science program? That kind of leads to that dilemma. But one of the things that we've seen is that science and engineering really deal with major world challenges. If we're going to look at those big issues, uh, global issues, world issues, then we really need to look at the role of engineering and science. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, as the practices have been defined in science education, they parallel those in engineering. And if you're even following along maybe with the next generation science standards at your computer, you may want to draw up, I believe it's Appendix E, and that's the one that has the practices. I'll just double check that I had that out. Oh, it's F, the Science and Engineering Practices. And there you can look at the eight practices. Maybe I'll just go through them real quick. Asking questions, developing and using models, planning and carrying out in investigations, analyzing and interpreting data, using mathematics and computational thinking, constructing explanations and designing solutions, engaging in argument from evidence, and obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. These are all important. 
whether it's science or engineering. And these will help lead to addressing major world challenges. Uh, the other thing is that engineering can be a real motivation as well as these major world challenges that sometimes students uh, in science, as we all know, uh, kind of question sometimes the relevancy of the topic. But when it's tied to a major challenge and they're able to integrate engineering, it's something that will really empower them and I think get them much more involved in their science curriculum. And of course, that's the hope of the next generation science standards. I've used a lot of terms already, in particular engineering, science. And you know, they've, they've done a very good job, I think, in the next generation science standards of defining these terms, as well as in the K-12 science framework. So they originally had come up with some definitions of science, technology, and engineering and then redefine those in the next generation science standards. And so as you'll see here, science is really defined as those traditional curriculum areas, whether it's earth science, environmental science, biology. That's what we're defining as science, those basic uh, units of study. But then technology is being defined as a human-made system and process. And then engineering is any engagement in a systematic practice of designing to achieve solutions to a particular human problem. And one of the things that I often like to refer to, I'll just hold up an iPad, it really doesn't matter what the tool is, but oftentimes I'll ask people, well, is this science, is it technology, or is it engineering? And I think, of course, people are going to respond to that kind of thinking that it's a trick question. but in reality, what we're looking at is this iPad is really technology. It's a human-made system. It's helping us solve some sort of human problem. But in order to come up with this piece of technology, it had to be engineered. It had to uh, have some sort of process to solve the solution to how to actually make this thing practical for human use. And it relied upon the application of science, plenty of physics, that had to be involved in understanding how to make one of these iPads so that when the average person now picks this up and they take a look at it, well, there's a lot going on here. It's a very interesting device. Everybody likes the device. But do they think about this piece of technology and how much engineering went into it and how much science was actually involved in developing this piece of technology? So. That's kind of what we look at when we look at those definitions. And one of the things I think that we want is that students really start seeing what is science, technology, and engineering. As I mentioned earlier, and, and you can review in your next generation science standards, the eight practices of science and engineering, not just the eight practices of science. And as you'll see on this, and I'll go through each of the bullets just in case you don't have a computer in front of you there and you're just doing the audio, and that is that students K through 12 get to go over all eight of these practices in every single grade band. And the reason that I use grade band is we'll talk about something about engineering design in a little bit, which is a, a grade band. Um, as a lot of you know, the next generation science standards have are written for grades K, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the bands middle school 6, 8, and high school 9, 12. But the point being is that students K through 12 get to be involved in all of these practices throughout all of the grade bands. And the practices are going to grow in complexity and sophistication over all of those grades. And this, of course, has been a problem. We see it in the United States as a problem in terms of just science education, that many of our students are not getting science at every grade. And that science is not growing in complexity and sophistication. And that's a very, very important component. Every practice, if you take any um, practice at all or any standard at all that you look at in the next generation science standards, right at the beginning of it, you will see the practice. And it will be either science or engineering. Sometimes the engineering is at the end of the standard. And these practices really represent what students are expected to do, not what we do. 
And that's always been a big issue when we look at the next generation science standards. As we look at these things of being really assessments, not a curriculum. And the practices aren't separate. They overlap. They interconnect. So that if I'm doing a study on climate change, I will utilize uh, all the practices throughout, although my uh, assessment may be emphasizing just one of those practices. And finally, the practices are language intensive, and they really require classroom science discourse. And one of those practices dealing with argumentation, sharing those that information with others. That takes place whether it's science or it's engineering. And that's what's really powerful about these practices, is that they lead to our goal of students aren't just doing science, they're not just doing engineering, and doing that in isolation in their own classroom. They're going to be sharing what they've learned with others and are able to uh, defend what it is that they've done. There's two appendices, and I, I see that Kristen has added one down there, which is Appendix F. I'd really encourage you to look at these two appendices. The first one is Science and Engineering Practices in the Next Generation Science Standards. That's Appendix F. And then the other one is Engineering Design in the Next Generation Science Standards, and that's Appendix I. As a note, too, and I don't know, Kristen, if you could add that or maybe at least a little note about it, that the app, which is uh, also on the GLOBE website, but if you go to the uh, Apple uh, uh, App Store, and I believe it's in the uh, Android Store as well, the Google Play Store, there's an NGSS app which has all of these resources on it as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we talk about engineering design a little bit, and this is, this is a little bit different as compared to the engineering practices. And that's what we see within the NGSS. There's the engineering practices, and then there's the engineering design. And as far as engineering design, one of the things that the students are going to do first is they're going to state a problem. And that problem has to be as clear as possible. They have to define what their criteria are for success. What are some of the constraints? Or what are some of the limits? That's really different than what we do in a science classroom for the most part. We will oftentimes state our problem, but then we really don't look at what are the criteria for success or constraints or limits on that. So when we look at engineering design, that's the first thing. Can a student state a problem? Can it be very clear? Are they looking at terms of success? What are some of the constraints that are on that deal with that problem? Then secondly, they need to generate a number of possible solutions. Then they have to evaluate those solutions, which best meet that opportunity for solving that problem. So they're stating a problem. They're starting to look at what are some criteria for success. They're looking at some of the limits. They come up with a number of different possible solutions. And then they have to evaluate those possible solutions based on criteria and constraints of the problem. Then finally, they're able to test and refine solutions so that the final design is improved by trading off various features. So as we look at this engineering design in comparison to the uh, engineering practices, which, are, which parallel the science practices, the practices keep going over those eight um, practices that an engineer or a scientist would do on a regular basis. Engineering design is really starting to look specifically at a problem and how you might be able to come up with a, a solution to the problem and then actually come up with that solution. And engineering design, when you look at, over, look at it over a K-12 um, period of time, I think what the uh, next generation science standards do is do a very nice job of, of Trying to break that down, you'll see that in Appendix I, that K through 2 with the little kids, that what we really want to do is look at some problems that people want to change. Have them explore that issue. But then when we get into the upper elementary grades, we start looking at more of a formal pro problem-solving method. So the little kids, K through 12, are looking at problems that people want to change. Upper elementary kids are looking at much more of a formalized problem solving. But then when we get into middle school, 
we start sharpening that focus, we start really looking at what are those criteria, constraints of the, of the solutions to the problems. So they're really starting to take a critical look at the problems and how they might go about, about solving them. And then by the time we get to high school, they should be well prepared to deal with very complex problems that deal with social and global significance. So that's the whole process of, of engineering practices, of doing those practices on a regular basis. Then with engineering design, look at how we actually come up with a problem and solve that problem and look at it over a K-12 process that we're taking steps along the way to get to our final goal. Now on the GLOBE program, when you look at engineering, I don't think that's a real strong point of GLOBE. And I think that's something that especially in the upcoming work that's going to be taking place, we're going to look at much more of what the um, how engineering and GLOBE can be much more closely related. And I gave a few um, examples from the GLOBE website that you might like to look at. If you, for instance, just go to teaching and learning and then select inquiry-based instruction. But to just kind of give you an idea, I wanted to bring in something that I showed at the National Science Teachers Association, something that I've been working with for um, the last couple of years. And as a lot of you know, uh, something that's used in GLOBE is uh, multi-spec, and we go into remote sensing, uh, remote sensing um, taking uh, some uh, real-world examples at the ground, ground truth thing, and seeing what that looks like. Well, what we found out is that a lot of students had a difficult time understanding remote sensing, which is found in GLOBE, and it's very important. So we had worked on a grant with NASA and what we actually came up with is something called an Aeropod. And on this Aeropod are a couple of cameras. And you can see those lenses down below. But this lens allows us to get visible light. This one allows us to get near infrared light. And so what we're able to do is after uh, flying this, we actually fly these on a kite at about 1,000 feet. We then take the video images out of here, overlay them, use multi-spec, some other programs as well, and actually do some image processing. Start to determine what is on the ground, and then use the GLOBE practices to ground truth what has actually been determined. But not only do we do that, one of the things that we've seen kids get involved with is how can we make this Aeropod even better? Get into that whole engineering piece. And as we've actually come up with an evolution of, um, of aeropods, they've changed over time. We're seeing kids are, want to put various, um, uh, make sleds so they can put probes on them, fly them from a, a kite, collect various data from them. So we're starting to use those engineering practices. And on our team as a scientist from NASA, who's involved in this process, and kids have the opportunity to share their thinking with him. So the idea is that I think GLOBE is very open to the possibility of engineering. I think we just have to think about how we can use um, engineering within our GLOBE protocols, especially as we look at student investigation. So I'll put this down. And uh, I think at this point, we'll turn it over to uh, Kristen. And she has a few questions that she would like to uh, share with you. Thanks, Dave. That Welcome. was awesome. It was really nice to see the example, too, so thanks for sharing that. Welcome. Um, hi, I'm Kristen Wagner. I'm a project manager at the GLOW program. Um, and I'm excited about this, um, this webinar also because my background, my undergrad, is in environmental engineering. So um, it's fun to see how GLOBE fits into that and how I wish I had GLOBE as a, as a student. Um, and so we're going to go through a series of questions. It's an opportunity to hear from you. Um, and Raise your hand in the, in the webinar, or um, let me know to unmute you, or also feel free to type your answers into the chat room. Um, and so I'd like to hear from you. We're going to go through the same questions that we've gone through for um, the past webinars, but this time really thinking about everything we just heard and explored with, with Dave um, about engineering. So the first question, let's see. What will teachers need to know about GLOBE to address the NGSS?
So thinking of um, everything we just went through, especially the practices and how um, GLOBE can fit into engineering or engineering can fit into GLOBE, how, what would teachers need to know um, to be able to explore this or to address this in their classroom? So Marcy says, in terms of engineering, I think teachers will need some ideas about how to transition from protocols into engineering. Great. And that's something we've heard um, in, the, in the past webinars, too, of how to take the protocols and use that transition into something bigger, into inquiry or project-based learning. So in this, um, how to transition the protocols into engineering. Um, Dave, thanks for the information about um, the iGuard project. That's really helpful. Hello? I'm going to try something. I'm going to unmute some people and see how that works. Um, so Marcy says, maybe also more about how engineering is involved in the globe scientist work. Great. So actually hearing real examples and how um, some of the scientists that are part of our GISN or International Science Network, Scientist Network, how do they actually use that in their in their professions and jobs. Curious if anyone else has any ideas. Um, Svetlana, Susan, Lisa, Fatima. Okay, Svetlana, thanks. So carefully examine learning objectives for protocol and related activity. Um, so it seems like you mean GLOBE should do that. Carefully examine learning objectives for each protocol and related activity, and so we'd have to communicate that with potential teachers. Am I muted? Nope. Not anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, that it would be that if, the, if teachers were taking responsibility themselves to align GLOBE and CSS, they'd have to be really clear about uh, what it is that they were trying to accomplish. It's sort of uh, deconstructing the, the protocol to make sure that they're actually aligning. So that's something that an individual teacher would do, but something that we can also provide exemplars and uh, uh, Great. To, to guide teachers uh, for the organization as a whole. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, who else do we have? Fatima says, um, the work they do. Um, so do you refer to um, the GLOBE teachers and the work that GLOBE teachers do, or engineers or scientists? Maybe expand on that a little bit more. Um, yes, Dave, <laughs> to respond, um, I might look at practices very different from the classroom teacher. Yes, um, I think so. I participated in an NST engineering course, and, and it was helpful to see how um, I think teachers would use the practices, um, and also seeing how the potential for teachers especially GLOBE teachers or K-12 teachers, to really be able to identify the practices and use those in the classroom. One thing I, I guess, wish my undergrad professors would do would be able to kind of articulate that more or say this is a little bit more of what we're doing. It's a guided path. Um, Fatima says both. Great. Um, so I guess just being a little bit mindful and talking about the work that GLOBE teachers do and also scientists um, and engineers related to engineering. So. Um, at the last webinar, we brought up case studies, and so this is coming up again as far as being able to present examples of what people are doing. Um, Gary says, a great example of engineering within GLOBE's science protocols is the development of the sun photometer by David Brooks and Forrest Mims. Hopefully you said that right. Um, great. That's a really good point. Um, Gary, I don't think you're muted if you want to expand on that at all. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, back in um, late 90s, uh, Forrest Mims and David Brooks uh, began development of a, a handheld sun photometer uh, to uh, begin collecting aerosol data for GLOBE, actually prior to uh, for GLOBE, um, working on another project. Uh, Forrest Mims um, uh, is, is a genius uh, to himself. Um, uh, developing uh, various instruments and David Brooks as well. So they've both um, uh, developed um, instruments beyond uh, beyond the sun photometer. But the um, 
at, at one point in time in, in uh, the early stages of the sun photometer, there was actually a kit that students could uh, build a sun photometer, um, which is a great way of, of understanding how it operates um, and uh, uh, being able to collect data with something that they build themselves. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's fun to hear about the developments and that they're still carrying it on. Um, David also mentioned that um, I often think how Forrest carried probes with him everywhere. He'd carry them in the back of planes back in the day. That's great. So it's, it's definitely a part of GLOBE. Um, it's, and it's helpful to have these conversations to, to define it. How, it would oh, be really Lisa. Cool. I'm going to, you are unmuted, Lisa, um, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about that too, about the Maker Fair. Oh, sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Welcome. Okay. I wasn't sure if my mic was on. Uh, so I, I just, what Gary was just talking about reminded me of um, the Maker community, uh, at least in the, in the U.S., um, there are people working on instruments that attach to iPhones and things like that that, um, that are that you can make yourself, and so collecting data um, through some sort of sensors that um, that people can construct themselves might be, you know, an interesting community to get in touch with. But I don't know much about them. I was at a maker fair this weekend, but I, I don't know much about that community. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for posting. Um, I just put a link in the the chat conversation about that. Um, looked it up. So let's move on to the second question. Um, what resources should GLOBE provide to help teachers address the NGS NGSS? Um, so it was helpful to hear right now just some examples of communities out in the world that are doing that, and also just um, hearing from GLOBE members that um, are working on engineering um, as part of their involvement in GLOBE. So one step further, what resources do we need to provide to teachers? Marcy, I like that. Um, to have a GLOBE contest for students to develop less expensive GLOBE equipment that also meets the standards. Great. And by that you mean the NGSS standards or the standards for the GLOBE oh, no, protocol? No, the, the standards actually yeah. uh, for the p any piece of equipment. And that makes me think about here in Iowa we had a group of students that met with uh, Lynn Chambers and one of the things that she mentioned in her talk with them was that she had wished that there was a protocol along with the contrails that measured not just um, whether it was persistent or spreading or, or anything, but also the length of it. And so those students spent a semester and they, they really went through the engineering design process of developing a new process for measuring the length of a contrail. And they went through several cycles of improving their, their protocol. So they weren't developing a physical piece of technology, they were de but they still were doing engineering um, and, and came up with at least a limited way to uh, measure the length of a protocol. And I can imagine that students would be able to do that with uh, things similar to that with many of our um, many of our different protocols, whether it's developing a new piece of equipment or um, or a, just a different way of doing something or adding a different set of data to what we collect. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Julie, you said examples. I, I unmuted you if you'd like to expand on that at all. Is that working? Yeah, we hear you. Um, I was thinking that, um, I don't know, I, like both Gary and Marcy have mentioned, like um, just show them case studies or examples of things done in the past, like some photometers and the um, contrails. Um, and I really like this less expensive equipment idea too. Um, yeah. But it would be great to show like real cases of students doing exactly this with GLOBE resources. Awesome. Thanks. Um, would this be something that we could do through the STARS or some type of kind of profile of students doing that out in, the, in their classrooms or outside in the world? I think doing the STARS would be awesome. Okay. But even cool. having um, whatever's being developed at this workshop coming up, like I just think that case studies are really um, a thing that needs to be highlighted. Cool. Thank you. We are going to trans. Oh, go ahead. Someone else is going to say something. Yeah, just quickly, this, I'm not sure this is a resource, but 
um, you know, we're working with both career technical education teachers as well, as well as science teachers, and of course, one of the purposes behind that was that, that the CTE instructors, or the career technical education instructors, in those classes, kids actually build things uh, in many cases. Um, uh, and uh, it may be eventually a, a good resource to have to sort of guide science teachers in how to connect with their CTE instructors on their own campuses to sort of collaborate on doing things like building equipment or understanding in engineering design um, principles and processes that are that are being implemented through GLOBE. So Great. It's not, a, it's not a thing, but it's a, uh, a process or, or a, a tool or a mark, a, you know, some kind of right. uh, explanatory sort of information. Sure. And we definitely have the ways to be able to have those communications on our website and online discussion boards to be able to share those processes. I think a lot of this is, is what happens throughout the whole process, and so it's helpful to hear that. Um, Dave says, resources needed engineering fields that are aligned more to GLOBE since there are so many engineering fields. Yes, I highly agree with that. Um, I think a lot of times, even in engineering schools, they don't even know all the different types. And so I think it's helpful to show um, all the different types. So a lot of times people fall back to, well, they just build bridges or they design roads. And I think there's so much more than that. Um, so it'd be helpful to kind of showcase that. Um, and also provide an Ask an Engineer to go along with Ask a Scientist. Very cool. Um, and that goes back to getting the kids connected or students connected to, to professionals that are out in the field. Um, so we're going to transition to the next question. So one step further, what should uh, NGSS professional development or PD session during a GLOBE workshop look like? A lot of people on this call are partners, and so you're conducting professional development, so some of you have gone through the, um, the GLOBE training recently. So thinking back, what types of resources or um, sessions should be provided to, to teachers at a GLOBE workshop? Raise your hand if I need to unmute you. If you try talking, we don't hear you. Well, just one quick thought that any PD should be as hands-on as possible. That's obviously a kind of a no-brainer, but to the extent that you can have uh, a CTE instructor or an engineering instructor uh, uh, where, where teachers are actually doing things during the workshop and actually uh, themselves um, um, participating in the engineering design process so that they're actually uh, seeing how it works. And uh, we also like to have uh, instructors or teachers going into workplaces themselves as a form of professional development. I know that's probably a little bit beyond what we find here but the degree that you can have uh, teachers actually interacting with engineers directly, it, it enriches uh, the conversation tremendously. For sure. Yeah, I would second, this is Marcy, I would second that in, in all of our GLOBE PD, we always have our students, or our, our teachers, um, not only collect data, but they, um, uh, we present a question to them or let them select among questions, and by the end of our workshop, they, uh, in their group, actually present uh, their research that, they're, that they did in their scientific investigation uh, over at least one of the protocols that they learned how to use in the, in the workshop. And I think the same thing with the engineering. Um, maybe, it would, maybe, maybe in some workshops it would be as simple as having them do that activity where you study the instrument shelter, because in that activity you're really studying yeah. how the instrument shelter was designed to follow this certain set of criteria. Um, or in some other way, hands-on experiencing some kind of engineering but also bring to their attention that that is, you know, when we do that activity, we usually don't say, and this is engineering. <laughs> we usually just, um, we don't maybe go that far. So maybe more explicitly drawing attention to that or giving them an engineering experience during the workshop. Yeah. And, and on that, we, that came up a lot in the past webinar conversations, um, was, was really just having participants go through that. Um, so if they're learning about inquiry-based learning, to actually go through the process of inquiry-based learning. And so um, it sounds like going through the process of actually designing and testing and seeing, like having some type of 
session where they kind of have to go through that. Gary, go ahead. I don't think you're muted. Oh, okay. I yeah. could have just horned in, right? You could have. <laughs> okay, so um, I just would like to follow Marcy uh, on her comments and say, I mean, that's that's a great idea, and have them have the teachers break up into perhaps smaller groups and dissect um, uh, dissect the instrument shelter activity or dissect a uh, the building a thermometer activity. Um, look at look very closely at the um, the various skills that are necessary to understand the goals of the activity. So for instance, even um, going beyond engineering, I know we're looking at engineering at this one, but even looking at like the uh, clinometer, uh, you build a clinometer, which there is some engineering developed in that, but there's also mathematics. And so you you end up having students, or the teachers in this case, uh, begin to um, find those tidbits, uh, those nuggets of, of great skills that cross cross lines of science, engineering, mathematics, and um, uh, and science. And so all of the STEM disciplines are then um, attacked by several different activities, where the, stu the the teachers are actually coming up with all of those nuggets out of the activities. Great. Thank you. Um, and I, it goes back to the alignment of Common Core and math skills too, and I think it would be helpful to show that and present it to teachers and all the other things that students will be going through. Um, so Susan says, demonstrate a progression of a set of skills leading to a complex protocol in an upper grade. Um, and Dave, thanks for the feedback. He says, great point. I think of how many times kids have asked why the shelter is designed as it is. Good. Um, so this is a really great conversation. It was helpful to hear from each of you. Um, and I also see Marcy on the screen. So um, we're going to end. If anything else pops up or if you'd like to share anything else or if we didn't hear from you, please type it into the, the chat window. Um, otherwise, we're going to move on to the next portion of the webinar. So thank you. Thanks so much. That was a really good conversation. And I think we could uh, talk for like three or four more hours just on uh, engineering and in GLOBE. Um, the next discussion that we're going to have, though, um, is uh, GLOBE and aligning GLOBE to the next generation science standards. And before we talk about the alignment to uh, NGSS, I wanted to revisit one of the very important aspects of how the next generation science standards are different than our past standards. Um, so in the next few slides, to begin with, we're going to be using this uh, graphic organizer of three boxes. And on each slide, the first box is the standard, the second box is instruction, and the third box is assessment. So they're all, all the color is going to change a little bit, and the content of those are going to change, but the boxes are the same. Um, and that's because standard-based instruction is dependent upon successful alignment between these three elements, the standards, the curriculum, or classroom instruction, and the assessment. And so before we go into NGSS, we're going to take a look at an example from the National Science Education Standards from 1995. This is an earth science standard from fourth grade, weather changes from day to day and over the season. Weather can be described by measuring quantities such as temperature, wind direction, speed, and precipitation. So that's the standard. That's our goal. And that goal is met through alignment with what happens in the classroom and alignment with the assessment. So together I want, you to, I want us to think about and have a couple people maybe type into the box um, or, or those of you who aren't muted, um, go ahead and just um, speak up and say, um, what are some things that you've heard about or that you could think of teachers doing in their classroom that would help them address the standard and get their students ready to be assessed in the standard. And let's just take maybe two minutes to do that. And if you type it into the um, box, I'll read it out loud. So 
again, the question is, if you were having, if you were planning classroom activities for the standard weather changes from day to day and over the seasons, and it can be described in measurable quantities such as temperature, wind, direction, and speed, and precipitation, what might you do in a classroom to get your students ready for that? Um, just to note, this is Kristen again, there's a little bit of feedback, so I put almost everybody on mute. Um, so just raise your hand in the window on the top left if you'd like to be unmuted. I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand. I did brainstorm about this myself. You could have students collecting the GLOBE protocol for temperature and uh, precipitation. You might have your students read uh, Gail Gibbons' book on weather. Uh, Gary says you could have your students do, the, or he might have his students do the weather and climate activity from uh, the, the um, student climate campaign. And Susan says over a week period they could check their local weather site each day and record all the data. They could ground check it, check it with instruments um, outside of their classroom. So those are um, uh, several different ways and we could come up with many more ways um, for this classroom activity, this instruction to get students prepared for the assessment. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is that research has found that teachers will not implement activities that they feel do not prepare their students for standardized assessments. So now we're going to look at um, the assess an assessment example for this protocol, or I mean this standard. And so here's one example of an assessment question for this standard. This is a real question from a 2010 state test, and the question is, the data table below shows an average monthly air temperature for Albany, New York for the first four months of the year. During which two months shown would snow most likely stay on the ground without melting? This was the only question about weather and season on the fourth grade test for this year. So I think we could have a we could have an hour long discussion just about um, how well does this question align with that standard? Does it cover the whole standard or not? But let's just set that aside. If you were a teacher, if you're a fourth grade teacher in your classroom and you knew that this was the only assessment item for the standard, how might that change how much classroom time or what you would do in your classroom regarding the standard? If this was the only question your student we're going to answer, address to this, would you spend 12 weeks doing GLOBE activities and collecting data and having your students analyze it? And I'll just let you think about that for yourself. And now we're going to look at how uh, the next generation science standards are a little bit different. So we have the same graphical organizer with the standard, the instruction, and the assessment. Um, in NGSS, the standard is a student performance expectation. It describes what will be assessed. So the right side and the left side of this graphic are already aligned for all standards. We're switching here to looking at a third grade uh, NGSS standard that's similar to that fourth grade um, NSES one. And this standard is um, that students will represent data in tables and graphical displays describe typical weather conditions expected during a particular season. Um, how does this change how we need to think about what needs to happen in the classroom? And again, if anybody wants to uh, uh, chime in and think about how does, how does this shift from having the standard and the alignment be the same statement change how we think about what goes in the middle?
Julie says it aligns more with GLOBE. Have them collect data and graph it. And Susan says students may have to identify two or more conditions that go together. And Julie says they could look at past data for seasonal changes. So those are some great ideas for things that could happen in the classroom. Um, I'd like to propose that when we think about what needs to happen here, we're really doing another shift in how we deal with standards, instruction, and assessment. Um, if, our, if, our, if we limit what happens here in this middle to only representing data in tables and graphical displays and describing typical weather conditions expected during a specific season, then we're really aligning our instruction to our, we're aligning our assessment. We're doing activities that could provide great assessment to the standard. But we might not be preparing our students to actually be assessed in this standard. So for example, in this um, standard itself, students, before they represent data in tables and graphical displays to describe those typical conditions in different seasons, they're going to need some things. They need weather and climate data that they can put into tables. They need skills necessary to create tables and graphs and also skills necessary to interpret and describe tables and graphs to others. And they're need, going to need enough knowledge and experience with the concepts of seasons to be able to describe typical weather conditions in different seasons. So when we see that these two parts of the, um, of the alignment are identical to each other, that might change how we think about the middle a little bit. And we really have to um, concentrate really strongly on what needs to happen that's supposed to be needs to happen here. So here I've added some ideas about what would need to happen in the classroom in order to prepare students to be assessed for this standard. And I color coded these ideas and events to match the NGSS dimensions, those practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disciplinary core ideas. And what I want you to notice is that the students are going to be using several of the other practices in the classroom to prepare themselves to be assessed on the student performance objectives. So the students need to, or, or the students would be obtaining weather data for different seasons, either by collecting it themselves, downloading it, um, viewing it on, on uh, their local weather station, like Susan suggested, but in some way they have to obtain weather data. And that is not the same uh, practice as representing uh, data in tables and graphs. It's actually one of the other eight practices in NGSS. And then the students would be applying mathematical and computational skills as they learn how to use spreadsheets and graphing. And maybe they would have done that in a unit, you know, three units before this, and they already ha the teacher knows they have those skills. Or maybe they need to develop those skills in this unit so that they can organize, analyze, and interpret that data that they're going to be explaining seasons with. Um, and then students discussing or using argument and evidence and um, their similarities and differences, that's patterns, in about weather in different seasons. So those are things that might happen in the classroom that represent several of the practices all related to that same disciplinary core idea about uh, seasons and also related to the same cross-cutting concept of finding patterns. And if students would do those things in instruction, then they'll be ready for assessment. So what does this mean for alignment? First most, it means that if we align our activities only to the practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the DCI in the per student performance objective, then what we're really doing is creating an alignment for assessment and not an alignment for instruction. That might not be a bad thing. Some GLOBE, re globe resources might make very good assessments for NGSS. But we don't want GLOBE activities to only be used in assessment. We want them to be used in classroom instruction. 
And if this is what happens, then we have to concentrate on what will happen here in instruction. We were going to do another example today, but I think we're, um, we're a little, we'll, we'll try it and we'll see how far we get. I've taken the middle school um, earth science standard, develop and use a model to describe how unequal heating and rotation of the earth cause patterns of atmospheric and oceanic circulation that determine regional climate. Um, so this is a middle school example. And if we're going to do the alignment for this standard, the first question we ask is, in the classroom, what needs to happen here to prepare students for this assessment? Our second question would be, what globe resources can provide those experiences and then our third step in alignment is, how well does each of these globe resources contribute to these experiences alone or bundled together as a group of activities? And um, so what I think, I think we do have just a couple of minutes. If this was our standard here, develop and use a model to describe how unequal heating and rotation of the Earth cause patterns of atmospheric and oceanic circulation that determine regional climate. What sort of, of experiences would we need to give our students so that they would be prepared to be tested on this? Does anyone have any suggestions? David says the, um, the systems poster. So we could bring up the system poster and those activities to help them get a background on um, climate. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, David, you can talk. Did you want me to elaborate on the poster? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and. Oh, I was thinking we do uh, so many activities uh, with the poster. And when we look at that particular poster and we start looking at how um, uh, various components of our atmosphere, we start looking for patterns that are occurring. And maybe what we can start seeing is as we look at those patterns, we start seeing how um, we could actually start developing a model. We're starting to put, I guess it's really putting those uh, patterns together and how could we demonstrate those patterns to others. That would uh, eventually lead us to uh, some sort of model. Um, I guess it's, it's almost like uh, painting a picture or something else or writing a short essay. You finally understand how these patterns are uh, occurring between the atmosphere and the ocean and how those would relate to a climate. Maybe you could write about it, but could you also develop a model that you could uh, help use to explain to other people what this means and predict what uh, might occur in the future? Yeah. And Lisa says, comparing weather data from the northern and southern hemisphere throughout a year. I think that would be, again, be um, kind of on the same level of you're giving them experiences looking for those patterns and now they're going to have to explain them and one of the ways they could explain them is through developing a model. So to review, um, we really have about a three part process in getting from uh, getting to alignment from standard through instruction and assessment. And the first is, if this is our assessment, what needs to happen during instruction? The second is, what globe resources can provide those experiences that we said need to happen? And the third is, um, some sort of an evaluation of that alignment. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail today about how we're going to do that um, assessment, but we did want to make sure that we pointed out to everyone that the global alignment that we're creating is not going to be just a spreadsheet of 
the protocols and activities on you know, the rows and the standards on the columns and Xs in boxes, that there will be a, an evaluation of how strong the alignment is between any given activity and standard um, or set of activities and, and standards. And the tool that we uh, anticipate using for this is called the Achieve OER Rubric. And here's just um, one example of one of the rubrics and some of the criteria that before you can use this rubric, you have to already have an alignment proposed between the learning object, which would be the activity or the protocol or the um, globe cloud chart or the visualization tool, um, and whatever the standard is. And then you rate the degree to which any individual object aligns to the proposed standard. Um, we will probably adopt, adapt that a little bit because of the three-prong nature of NGSS, where every standard is a, is a practice, a cross-cutting concept, and a disciplinary core idea, almost no resources will reach that superior length because they won't include all of those things. But we'll, we'll also score um, a proposed group of GLOBE activities that you would use together to reach a standard. And if you use those things together, maybe you'd reach a higher level of alignment. And then a little caveat that the Achieve OER rubrics were meant to be used with any set of standards, but they were developed specifically for the Common Core. And that's why we um, may be doing some uh, tweaking to uh, how we use those rubrics. So thank you very much for joining us today. I wish that we had more time. I think this webinar probably could have taken two or three hours uh, to have some great discussions. Um, if you want to learn more about the topics that we, used to, that we discussed today, uh, you can visit the GLOBE website, the Teaching and Learning, Learning Standards section. If you're a U.S. Uh, partner, you can also go to the U.S. Partner Forum and the additional NGSS implementation resources. That's the place where partners are proposing resources that they use to connect to NGSS that may eventually end up in that Teaching and Learning, Learning Standards section. So basically, that's where we're vetting things to be able to move them up to the next section. Also, if you want to dig deeper into the topics of this specific webinar, as David said, uh, his content was Appendix F and Appendix I from NGSS. And you can learn more about those OER rubrics at the Achieve website listed here. Thank you again. Uh, this is all for, of our webinars for uh, this series. Um, and as uh, in the past, all of our webinars are available for viewing on the GLOBE website in the Teaching and Learning section. For those of you who will be joining us at the GLOBE and NGSS Alignment Workshop next month, we'll see you soon. And for anyone else, there will be other opportunities to assist us in the GLOBE and NGSS Alignment. Um, please watch the newsletters and announcements for opportunities to review the draft alignment this winter. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll turn off the recording and we'll hang around for just a little bit in case there are any questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.